Grow, Sell, and Retire is the podcast for the lazy overachiever. B.D. Dalton, author of True Gravity and Grow, Sell, and Retire, is here to give you his 25 years of secrets, tips, and systems to take your business to the next level. This is your chance to find out what is working in sales, marketing, and running your business. If you stop learning, you stop burning. Now, here's your host, BD, with today's GSR podcast. Hey, everybody, BD Dalton here with the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Today's interview is with Karen Green, and she talks about making your business a success. She's written a book all about success in your business in the food industry. And essentially, recipe for success, which means that she's really focused on making sure that people that are in food businesses, restaurants, things like that, actually make it in their business. And how is this going to apply to you? You know what? It doesn't matter if you're running a services business, if you're running a mechanics business, if you're running anything else. There's some things in here that she really gives you. And guess what? She even gives you some really good focus on making sure that you can negotiate. Also, she talks about the F-Up Ferry. She'll tell you about some different things that you need to think about when you're looking at your business, some things about social media, but really getting together, and she and I just talk about being an entrepreneur. So why don't you sit back, get your brain prepared, have a little bit of a listen. You might not run a food business, but you definitely run a business, and you are an entrepreneur if you're listening to this. Karen Green, Recipe for Success, interview on Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Get ready, sit back, and let's talk about food, being resilient, talk about vegan, talk about being prepared. This is my interview with Karen Green. BD Dalton here, Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. I'm BD Dalton, and I'm here with Karen Green. And we're talking about recipe for success. So you actually have it. So you're you're shortlisted for the Business Book Awards. I was there. Did you win? No, I didn't win. Um, so I was the finalist, but um, I had some really good feedback because I think one, mine was one of the few books that uh, that I wrote. Uh, and edited myself, and sort of sort of did a semi uh, self publish. So when when the publisher I was sitting with said, "So who edited your book?" and I said, "Oh, uh, me." And she went, "Yeah, but who edited it?" I went, "Yeah, still me." Um, and, and then she read it, and she came back to me, and she was like, "Wow, that's really good." So that was really great. Actually, it made me feel better for not winning. But um, no, it was, and I was I was looking at that because I talked to Mentor Dial Future Proof last week, a Mental Dial. And oh. um, talked to him future proof last week, and everybody else there had had books that were, everybody had a publisher, and it yeah. was one of those where it was amazing that we, we, people like you were because both of mine are self published, and it's and, and all these people get so much help, but you did amazing. I've been you know I've been through a lot of the ideas, a lot of the the thoughts around what you've written, and it's it's great stuff. So what got you into to food, it looks like you've been you've been on the dark side. So you've been on purchasing, and you've been on um, <laughs> you, you've helped people um, on on the commercial side. So let's go into it. I've pretty much been in food all my life. Uh, well, retail all my life. So my dad um, was a, a director of a, a department store in in Newbury, and so I was a Saturday girl there. I went and did a degree. Um, in management science, and I specialized in retail marketing, and then um, got onto a graduate scheme with Tesco, and kind of went from there as a buyer for Tesco, then up to Boots as a buyer, and did a variety of different roles with them, and then went across the table to be a, a seller of food and a developer of food, um, and then... Kind of 18 months ago, I wanted a bit of a lifestyle shift, so um, I created Food Mentor, wrote the book, and now we're sitting here. Very cool. And so so when you get to this, is, has food become more popular for people to create and things with Levi Roots and all these different things coming through? Not that people weren't doing it before, but are people trying to deliver more food product or is it still the same? I think there is a massive 
interest in food and if you look at the number of people who classify themselves as foodies it's grown tremendously over the years um so i think that's the first thing i think more and more people watch dragon's den and most people have something that they know that they can do so uh you know my signature dish is brownies so i would might think to myself well i could launch a, a brownie brand and other people have granola or they have a drink or something that's inspiring so people kind of go oh i've got an idea and then they kind of start researching it and and then they reach out to somebody like me and and, and off they go and and start a business and what do you when, when you look back? Because when when we're dealing with entrepreneurs with with my team, when 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 can you tell that something is just going to be just something, and or something that's actually going to be something that actually can be really commercial? What what are some of the traits that you see that you sit back from a professional point of view and say, okay, that that has the the traits that could go forward. Um, I think from a product point of view, it's something that's found a sweet spot in the marketplace. So in a lot of cases, it's it's a, a market that's maybe a bit tired. So if you look at things like Nut Butters, Pippa Nut came through with her brand. Um, in, in mixers, you've got Fever Tree that's like this runaway amazing success and, and the, the drinks market was very tired and they came in and they, they really redefined it. So if it's a market that's a little bit tired or a market that's new and emerging, um, that's going to do well. If a business um, has got some money behind it, because I think you need some money. I mean, there have been some success stories with no investment, but I think you do need some money to just get it off the ground. Um, and I think the other one is just is just the resilience to just keep going because as you know, as your, your clients will know, being an entrepreneur is really tough. And being a food entrepreneur, I think, is particularly tough because it's such a competitive market. Um, so, yeah, if I, if I meet a client who's really resilient and, you know, gets back up when they fall, I've got one I'm thinking of at the moment and she's, you know, she's had three or four knockbacks since we've been working together. But she just gets back up there and she goes, right, well, tomorrow's another day. We're going to do it. <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, resilience is, is a big thing because people don't understand that being an entrepreneur and I think even uh, harder uh, a food entrepreneur is because people are either going to like or not like the taste of your stuff or, and you're going to have to find your niches and things where it, it, it makes it very difficult I think it, it, looking, looking back at it but so that in go, going back to tired ideas or the emerging ideas so You've seen that you talk about Fever Tree, and you know we've talked about Pippa's Nuts, things like that. What what are some of the, is it the, the the trends? Are they moving towards condiments? Are they moving towards actual staple brands, as in food packaging and things like that? Or what's what do you see? I'm just trying to compare it to people that we deal with with manufacturing and software and things like that. How how are they looking at the twist? So the big trend this year is all around vegan and vegetarian. Um, so that's, that's a massive trend. So anybody who is doing vegan and then sort of the corollary of that is free from, free from is doing really well. And if you can do something that's free from and vegan, then you're, you're really on to a winner, especially if you can develop something that, that tastes amazing as well, because a lot of vegan products that have been, sort of alternatives to, um, you know, like when I grew up, you, you used to get TDP, which is texturized vegetable protein, I think it stands for. It's <laughs> not sexy, is it? But, is essentially what it was, wasn't it? Synthesis. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, you can get a, a vegan burger that when you cut it, it bleeds. Yeah. Um, so, so veganism is a tra- trend. Um what else? Snacking is a big trend. Protein, so things that have been um, had protein added into them. So fortified with protein is is pretty strong. 
Um, and then just sustainability, you know, which is a trend with everybody, but just making sure that, you know, plastic is probably the other, you know, we talk about food, but the other big thing is plastic. So getting rid of it, right? Getting rid of plastic is, is a massive challenge. Um, and everybody's kind of in theory committed to it. And then you say, okay, well, you know, a plastic bottle probably costs point five of a P if that to make on, on a blow mold, or you have a glass bottle that's going to cost you 15 P. Are you going to pay 15 more P more? Yeah. Cause there goes um, a lot of your profit. There goes a lot of your margin. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, packaging is, is a, is a big plastic is a big trend. And then, you know, what the government's trying to do with helping obesity. So reducing portions, reducing sugar, finding alternatives um, to help people get healthier. I think is a trend. And then I think there's a backlash to all that. And, you know, special chocolate is, seems to be doing really well as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't get fat, but here's some really, really good chocolate. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause everyone goes, well, really good chocolate's really good for you anyway. Cause it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And then throughout, throughout this whole process and, and when people are getting into niches and starting to look and create communities and people followings, are you seeing what, what social media are you seeing that your people are using the majority of in food? Is it is it is it back to Snapchat and things like that? Is it uh, so? What are you what are you seeing as the major trends for some of your outlying brands trying to get new communities? I think I think for for brands, Instagram is is probably the strongest because of course it's so based on visual. So people are doing a lot of making, creating a lot of content with, with food photography, um, and, and showing their brands in different positionings. Um, in terms of in get for me, if I engaging with clients, there's, there's a massive group on, on Facebook, um, which is food hub. Um, and there must be, I think when I last looked, there was 3,300 people in that group, which is a pretty sturdy. A lot of people. That's a pretty good one. You can test out lots of theories there. Yeah, it's a really supportive um, group of people. So there's people like myself, you know, business mentors, there's designers, there's PR, there's a lot of money for uh, people who have got brands. So people will put, uh, I don't know, oh my God, I've got to deliver something tomorrow to, to Penrith. Does anybody know how to do it? To I've just struck a deal with Ocado. What's the settlement terms that other people have? So it's a really great forum for people, food entrepreneurs to, to talk um, about their stuff. So I would say those are, the, those are the two from a branded point of view and from a sort of support side. And so when you when you start to look at it and you go back to the the Ocado reference is <clears throat> because I, I worked for Walmart like you worked for Tesco uh, b- back in the day and uh-huh. and and come from the land of Costco and mm-hmm. so is, is sometimes sometimes people think it's the the holy grail to get in those things but then the the margins are cut so short is is that still kind of the the, the nirvana of food delivery is is the the, the big boys. I think it really depends on your product. I mean, I've just been with a client today and we've been having this discussion. Um, and this is looking at ready meals and prepared food. And we've agreed that actually the route to market is very much the retailers because they have such a mass connection with people. But if you've got a premium brand that um, maybe is more suited to a specific, for example, London centric market, then the retailers may not be the right ones for you because they're not so good at at producing, you know, they're, they're much more nationwide. Um, or you, you know, if you've got an expensive food product, but actually it's more gift, you might be better suited to going to someone like John Lewis or online, not on the high street. Um, but in terms of, of margin, yeah, it's tough. You have to learn to negotiate, which is why I sort of train a lot of my clients to sort of, you know, understand the, the, the toing and froing. Um, but no, there is there is still good money to be made if, if you've got a strong brand and you've got a strong reason to be and you've got a good following because if people are, gonna, are prepared to pay for that. That's really cool. So 
you led me right on to the next question is, so, so if you're leading us into the, these discussions and you've sat on both sides of the table and you work with your clients and try to help them get through these ideas, how about top two negotiating tips? And this, obviously this will work for almost any business, you know, great for food, but everybody needs to learn how to negotiate with the big boys or even negotiate a regular contract with the small ones. So top two negotiating Uh, tips. Top two negotiating tips. I think the first one is pretty generic, which is be prepared. So really know your numbers and go through, you know, know your costs, know who your competitors are, know the kind of margins you think they're going to want, know the things that they might want that you can give away for free, which is the classic stuff. Um, And really think through... All, all the bad stuff. I always think, you know, be as, as negative as you can because actually then what will come in the meeting should be, should be more pleasant. The second top tip is one I learned on a course a few years ago, and I, I think this is really great because if you go on your classic um, training for a negotiation, they will teach you um, your ideal. This is your ideal point. This is your... I've done really well, and this is your walk away. But what I learned was you actually set a point for your walk away, which is above your absolute minimum, because what that enables you to do is to be in a much stronger position. So if you get down to what that walk away, which is above your minimum, I can't do it, um, it puts you in a stronger position and it gives you a little bit of a mental edge. And it works. That's really cool. And I think that the funny thing is you say, you say be prepared is is so, (laughs) it it should be so simple, but so many people don't do it. They don't, they don't come into meetings with notes. They don't come in prepared, truly prepared when they're looking at businesses, whether they're getting a loan or whether they're coming in to, to seal the deal with a a big client or a big, you know, buyer. No, and it's, and it's so easy to do now. So, you know, I always say to my clients, right, do you know who the buyer is? Yes. Right. Have you looked at them on LinkedIn? Have you seen, you know, have a look at their Facebook, have a look at what their social media posts are. Um, then do the same for the retailer. Then actually go and look at whoever you're meeting. And if it's retail, go to one of their stores, go to a small store, go to a big store go to the competitors, go and put your product on the plate. Really, really no. I mean, I had, when I was a buyer, people who come in and I'd say, well, have you actually been in a Boots recently? (laughs) Uh, No. Oh, uh, uh, Well, uh, and and you know, if if they're lying, they, they, because of course they, they can't articulate it properly. And, um, and then they're on the back foot. And the moment you're on the back foot, you're weak in negotiation. Yeah, and that's. I think that's a that's a big one. Okay, I got I got through re- reading a bunch of stuff, and then get to the. Tell us about the F up ferry. <laughs> the F up ferry. Well, I have to say, I have to credit it to to the MD I was working with at, at Shaban Foods, and he used to say, "As the F up ferry came." And I wrote a whole chapter on that. I was actually going to call the book this, and then um, <laughs> he was coaching me, went, you can't have that word on the front of a book. And, of course, there's several books now, which is, you know, don't give an F and, and what have you. So um, so the F up fairy really is, is the things that you're not prepared for. Um, and that can be anything from uh, what have I done wrong in the past, put the wrong prices in, <laughs> So you've ended up with the wrong price on the shelf. So everything's had to be recalled and then you've had to negotiate it to uh, contamination where we had metal contamination in some rice and we had to have it recalled. And then literally yesterday, there's a guy um, who runs a brand called Raw Snacks and he has, I can't exactly work out what he did, but I think he fell on his head and he's broken two vertebrae. Oh. And he's fine, but, you know, he's, he's a foodpreneur. He hasn't got, like, a big team around him, and he's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's all about having a plan B, um, whether, whether it's a plan B for covering you, which, you know, when we're all, well, not all of us, but food, if you're a, an entrepreneur and there is only you, what do you do if, if you keel over for six months? And, 
you know, the, the classic that everybody says is you should have six months salary in the bank. Well, you show me a, an entrepreneur that's got six months salary in the bank. Because well, if, if they're not making any money, then it's really easy to... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Six times nothing is not that hard, is it? That's correct. Um, that's most people are dealing with in a lot of ways sometimes. But, um, but yeah, I think it's having that plan B. And also what a lot of food people don't realize is you can take out insurance against the, 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 the effort ferry when it comes to product failures. So that's something people just don't think through. Um, so that's another way of kind of, of getting around it. But I think the other thing is that, again, this, this isn't just a food business. I think all businesses probably take six to 12 months longer than you think they're going to, to get where they need to be where you were hoping they would be yeah and i don't that's that's the thing that they don't teach you it they don't they don't teach you at business school <laughs> or, or in entrepreneur class or anywhere else is that just the time the timeline just drags and it's drag whether it's waiting for the marketing team to come back to you the website team or anything else it just it gets there so now on to some of the fun stuff about you <laughs> what are your what are your main goals or a goal that you have in place for 2018 Personal or business? So <laughs> well, personally, I bought a house this time last year in the okay. south of France to renovate, and I just want to get it to the stage where I can at least live in part of it. It's not that big a house before we get too excited. It's like a very small maison de village, which is like a terrace. Yes. Um, but it has nothing. It's not been lived in since 96, so it needs electricity plumbing etc so the electricity and plumbing is going in as we speak in goes the kitchen in goes the the bathroom and then um i'm hoping to have christmas there that's that's my goal that's awesome we're going to i'm going to cortona next month and that's where they, that's where they filmed the under a tuscan sun and so oh, just, yeah. just right at the base so you're going to be living that that lifestyle of food. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream, but I think I can get two floors done. But if I can, if I can get my revenue up a bit further, then we'll get the rest of it done by Christmas as well. But very cool. And what what projects or bur- books are you working on right now besides your client base that you already have in the food industry? So I've contributed to a book. Um, I don't actually know who, who the compiler is. Um, I'll have to send it for you for show notes, but it's, it's called women who dot, dot, dot. And it's a compilation of, of successful women from all different industries. So not just food. Um, and it's basically the, my story from, from as I started off, you know, with, from the department store onwards um, and just talking about, you know, what's inspired me and what's going to inspire them and, and so on and so forth. So I've got that. I've got quite a lot of speaking gigs lined up. And, and then I am kicking around what's, what's the next book. Um, and, you know, the publisher that I met at the Book Awards said it needs to be broader than food. So, you know, I've, I've spent the last 18 months reading and knowing that micro-niching is really the way we want to go. And now the publisher's going, no, 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 I don't want a micro-niche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, micro-niche doesn't have enough buyers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Micro-niche might work for your business, which it does, to be honest. But actually, for a publisher, that's not sexy. So, um, yeah, it, it will come to me. It will come. It will come in, in your sleep, in a dream, in a nightmare, and something. It'll. It'll. It'll be. <laughs> yes, and so, what's what's your favorite piece of tech right now that's either enhancing your life or making it more fun? Um, I'm not a techie person, um, but I guess from a lazy point of view, I do use Hootsuite quite a lot because I've just taken on a marketing um, manager um, to help promote me through this summer. And we're using Hootsuite to schedule in posts about, you know, tweet um, the book and the speaking gigs and, and various other events that we're lining up for the for the rest of the year. So, um, yeah, it's not super super techy, but it's 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 useful. Very cool. And so, what do you when you're doing all this stuff when you're getting ready to do the house in France and or, or you've had a, a hard day with one of your clients isn't listening to you, which probably doesn't happen that often, I'm sure. <laughs> But um, where do you get your inspiration or motivation from? Um, I I read a lot, so I get I I sort of subscribe to a few um, podcasts where people recommend books. 
Um, so I, I read a lot of books that inspire me about business. So um, do you know the book Launch? That's quite a famous one. I know it's been around for a while, but I've just started reading that, which is really interesting. There's another one, which is, um, again, I can send you the details. It's it's like a coffee table book. So it's beautiful photography, but it's about how to design a brand. Oh, cool. But, it, but it's really pretty. <laughs> so it's uh, so I'm 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 reading that as well. So so books, podcasts, um, various people that have inspired me. I, there's a lady called Natalie Sisson. I don't know if you know her. Suitcase entrepreneur. No, I, oh, I, I've heard of it, but I, I don't, do not know her. Yeah, she's a New Zealander, and she, she wrote the book Suitcase Entrepreneur, which I found really useful, um, where basically she was working completely location independent. And then she's kind of turned on her heels in the last sort of year, and she's bought a ranch in New Zealand. She settled down with a guy. They bought two dogs. And it's really interesting to see the transition, but she's still talking about freedom and, and how you can and work with your business and uh, make it more efficient so it's yeah she's really inspiring actually and again she she then recommends people and and you know on you go with your journey but I do I am a real believer in 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 being inspired by other people um and learning new things very cool and so and, uh, and it'll be in the show notes but where can we learn more about you so I have my website, foodmentor.co.uk, um, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I don't do Snapchat. That's, I'm just too old. Um, my daughter did try and set it up for me, but I didn't understand it. So, um, me neither. It's okay. <laughs> and, and for business, LinkedIn. So I, 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 I comment a lot on the food industry and, and food retail and put the odd um, article on there as well so and then that's going back to my blogs on on my uh, on my website awesome so now the, the the last question and thank you very much for all your time and everything else today is if you could tell yourself 20 years ago something that you should know today what would that thing be oh what would that thing be um probably put a little money away every day um because again, I, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, um, and he was talking about if you'd put away ten pounds a week twenty years ago, it would now be worth like a million pounds or something. Because this whole compound interest thing. So I think, yeah, just just putting money away every week as a little nest egg, and you just forget about it. I think that would be. I know that's not entrepreneurial, but I just no, think no, it's David, David, David Gray. David Gray said, so "Pay yourself first. That's yeah. right. Yeah, pay yourself first. And um, oh, it's Tony Robbins actually. No, Tony Robbins took it. David Gray did it for um, smart smart women finish rich, and that was it's a, which is a great book. But yeah, yeah. That, that the latte effect he called it is if you didn't buy that latte every day, then you could put that fifteen quid away every month. So it's it's awesome. So no, thank you so much for all that, and uh, I'll make sure we we get this out. And thank you very much for coming on the Grow Sell and Retire podcast. It's a pleasure. It's been really good. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us on Grow Sell and Retire. For more information, tools, or to book one of our team members to work with your team, business, or to speak at your event or conference, visit BartDaltonConsulting.com or email contact at BartDaltonConsulting.com. Buy the book True Gravity on Amazon. If you want to work for the rest of your life, that is your business. If you don't, that is ours.